Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program today. My name is Coogan Collins and I am the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and you'll study along with us. I personally hope that you'll always test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to what the Scriptures actually say. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it's too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we are capable of being wrong. One thing we can know for sure is that God's Word will never lead us astray. So always trust in it. As Psalm 146 and verse 3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 1830 says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course you can take that will walk you through the basics of the Bible. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I have preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials there as well that you can study and learn from and, and grow from. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you will find all the new video lessons like the ones you're watching right now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything, but I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy, but we must be careful that we don't become so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority in life. Hope you find today's lesson helpful and that it will help you grow spiritually. Be sure and share what you learn in this lesson with those around you. Now let's get to our lesson. I consider today's lesson as being extremely important to everyone that wants to go to heaven. So I hope you will pay close attention to what I will be saying and will think long and hard about it. When I ask the question, are you ready for the judgment day? You might think of the invitation song we sing that asks this very question. Are you ready for the judgment day? In fact, I want to take just a minute to read the words of this song which were written by Will L. Thompson back in the 1800s. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming. There's a bright day coming by and by, but his brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? There is a sad day coming, a sad day coming. There's a sad day coming by and by, when the sinner shall hear his doom. Depart, I know you not. Are you ready for that day to come? And the chorus says, Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready? For the judgment day. I think songs that remind us that there is a judgment day coming are great because we must never forget the simple truth. As the song said in the last verse, this is going to be a sad day for those who are not prepared for the judgment day. The Bible has a lot to say about being ready for the return of Jesus. Serving God and living the Christian life are certainly part of being ready for the judgment day. Sometimes we can have good intentions on being ready to serve God, but it doesn't always work out how we initially planned. And we can find ourselves unprepared to face the challenges that are set before us. A great example of this comes from the Apostle Peter. When Jesus was getting to the end of his ministry, he told his disciples that they would forsake him that night. But Peter didn't believe Jesus, as we read in Luke 22 and verse 33. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny three times 
that you know me. I have no doubt that Peter thought he would be ready to stand his ground for Jesus and even die for him. He had good intentions, but as we all know, when it came right down to it, he was not ready to follow Jesus all the way. When Jesus was arrested, Peter drew his sword and cut a man's ear off, but his courage left him, and he fled with the rest of the disciples. But he didn't go far because he followed Jesus as he was being carried away. Luke 22 and verse 55 says, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. When Peter realized he was not ready to follow Jesus all the way, as he said he would, and he heard the rooster crow and looked into the eyes of Jesus, it caused him to weep bitterly. We can only imagine how bad Peter felt at that moment. But I know it would have been one of the most difficult moments in my life if I were in his place. Like Peter, when we fail to follow Jesus all the way, and we realize that we have failed to be ready, it should move us to tears because we have failed to serve God as we should. And while we may not have denied Jesus verbally like Peter did, we are denying Him by our actions, or maybe I should say by our lack of action, because when we fail to love our Lord by obeying His commandments, we are at least in part turning our backs on Him. As Christians, we are taught to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.21 For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. One of the first things we must do in order to be ready to follow in the footsteps of Jesus is to deny ourselves. As Matthew 16.24 says, Then Jesus said to His disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Until we are willing to fully submit our lives to God, we will never be fully prepared to follow Jesus all the way. A great example of this comes from the rich young ruler that we read about in Mark 10 and verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The young man thought he was ready to do whatever it took to serve God so he could have eternal life. But he had one stumbling block, his money. He was willing to deny himself in many areas, but he was not willing to put God above his possessions. He had not learned the lesson that he cannot take his possessions with him when he dies. I feel sorry for this man because he seemed so eager to do the will of God, but he allowed his possessions to be more important than God. We have to make sure that we don't find ourselves in this situation because if we make our money or anything else more precious than serving God and living for Him, then we will not be ready to follow Jesus all the way. We cannot serve money and God at the same time. As Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus also said in Matthew 10 and verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If we want to be ready to follow Jesus, we must be ready to put God before our family and everything else. God cannot be second in our lives. He must always be first because He is the most important being in our life. We must never forget what Job said in Job 121. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. I want you to think about your life right now. Can you think of anything that you would put in front of God? Is there anything that robs you of your time that you spend with Him in prayer, reading His Word, or attending Bible class, or worship service? If you allow these things to hinder your service to God, can you honestly say that you are putting God first in your life above everything else? If you realize that you're putting things in front of God, then be like Peter. Grieve about it and then begin to change your ways and start putting God first in your life starting today. The Bible also tells us to be ready to give an answer. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Those in the Church of Christ used to be known as those who, who knew their Bibles. And if you wanted to know what the Bible said about something, just ask one of them. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. Since our lives have become busier and busier, and we devote less time to reading our Bibles, many struggle to give an answer to why they have this hope that is in them. If we ever, ever hope to be ready to give an answer, we have to make sure that we get into God's Word. As Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We all know that if we don't spend time learning about God's Word and what we need to know about telling people what they need to know about loving God and what it is that He needs, then we're going to be very rusty at it. It's going to be very difficult for us to do this. And if we continue on this downward spiral by neglecting God's Word, it will be devastating to the Lord's church. I just hope that history doesn't repeat itself as found in the book of Hosea in chapter 4 and verse number 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break all restraints with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now let no one contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophets also shall stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. If someone came up to you today and asked you why you're a Christian, or they want to know what it takes in order to become a Christian, would you be able to tell them from God's Word? If you put God's Word into your heart daily, then I can guarantee you that you will be able to do this. And we must have this attitude that Job had about making God's Word more necessary than his own food. Then, whenever you have that attitude and you're immersing yourself in God's Word, it's going to be easy for you to answer people why you have the hope in you and you're going to be able to do it with meekness and fear. I want to challenge you to start making more time for studying God's Word so you can be ready to give an answer. We all should know the basics of how to become a Christian and how Jesus made salvation possible for us all. But we need to grow beyond the basics and become better at answering other questions about God's Word as well. I'm certainly not saying that we are capable of knowing the answer to every question that is going to be asked, to, asked of us right away. But if we immerse ourselves in God's Word, 
we will be able to answer many of the questions people might ask us. Even when we don't know the answer, we should be able to go home and do more studying and find out an answer for them. When we keep doing this, it will cause us to grow and be more prepared the next time. As I already said, all of us, including new converts, should be able to tell people why we have this hope in us and how to become a Christian. Another area the Bible says to be ready for is to preach the gospel. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. It is true that Paul was telling this to an evangelist, but we should all be ready to proclaim the Word of God. In fact, this point goes hand in hand with the one we just looked at where we were called to be ready to give an answer. Again, the only way that you and I can do this and be ready to proclaim God's Word is to make sure that we get into it. We know what it says. That's the only way we can be ready in season and out of season. Timothy had to combat false teachers who were twisting the scriptures. But there was no way he could do that if he did not know what the Word of God said. We certainly can not be ready to rebuke a false teacher or convince someone to turn from their sins if we cannot show them why from the Bible. Paul was not asking Timothy to do anything that he wasn't willing to do. Paul said in Romans 1.15, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul understood the importance of being ready to preach the word. And one thing that helped him to be ready is found in the next verse, Romans 1 and verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul was never ashamed of the gospel, and he suffered physically for it over and over again. He understood that God's word must be preached, and that it was more powerful than a two-edged sword. How about you? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you willing to boldly proclaim God's word uh, no matter what might end up happening to you? It seems to me that more and more Christians are being secret Christians because they are not making their voices heard in our nation. Many times we sit on the sidelines and watch those of the world raise their voices and make their sinful ways become commonplace. For example, I think of the homosexual movement, which, by the way, is condemned under the patriarchal period, the law of Moses, and under the Christian age. To prove it, notice what God's Word says about it. Under the patriarchal period, Sodom uh, was going to be destroyed. They were guilty of many sins, but one of the sexual sins was homosexuality because the men of the city wanted Lot to hand over the angels that came to him uh, at time to warn him to leave the city. We read about this in Genesis 19 and verse number 5. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Carnally. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sexual immorality, which includes homosexuality. And Jude 1, 7 makes this very clear. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh and set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now let's move up to the time of the law of Moses to see if God had changed his mind about homosexuality. Leviticus 20.13 says, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Homosexuality was punishable by death under the old law. 
So, so far we have seen that God has not changed his mind toward the vile act of homosexuality. We need to keep in mind that today we are not under the patriarchal period, nor are we under the law of Moses. So what does the New Testament say about homosexuality? Well, it condemns this act in many places, but the clearest one is found in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. We are living in a unique time in our nation because the homosexual movement has had a great victory in the Supreme Court. All those in favor of this movement have worked hard to push the homosexual agenda. They have done it through the media and they've also done it through our kids' textbooks. We now have more and more people who do not see what the big deal is. There may come a time in the near future when preachers like myself will be put into jail for speaking against the sin of homosexuality under the idea of hate speech. Preachers and Christians alike better get ready because whenever it comes to teaching the truth of God's Word, the way our nation is headed, you may find yourself in jail as well if you speak against the sin of homosexuality. But you know what? It doesn't matter what the law of the land says. It doesn't matter what our Supreme Court says. God's Word is what we must teach. Many worldly people are doing their best to erase God out of our country every chance they get. The few are making great strides to move our nation away from God while the majority remain silent. But how about you? Are you being silent? Are you ready to take a stand for God's Word and let your voice be heard? Are you ready to tell people what the Bible teaches about homosexuality and the other sins in the Bible? Or are you ashamed of God's Word? If you are ashamed to uphold God's truth, then God will be ashamed of you. Mark 8 and verse 38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Oh, that none of us ever become ashamed of God's Word. Because we certainly don't want God to be ashamed of us. One thing that should help motivate us to take a stand on God's word is the fact that God wants every person to hear his word and have the chance to repent. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Also, 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 3 says, For... This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We need to realize that there are many people that are lost in their sins. And we may be the person that can reach that person. We may be that only unique individual that might have the opportunity to get the truth to them. And we need to become more courageous when it comes to speaking to others about God because we know that they are lost. And we're not doing them any favors by holding back the truth for them. So it's so important that we have that courage to be able to speak to them about God's Word. As Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 41, He says, Then He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from Me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, all those on the left are the lost. And they will go to the same place that the devil and his angels will. Everlasting fire does not sound good at all, which is why we must be ready to teach the truth to all who will hear, no matter what the consequences may be to us personally. Let us never forget what Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Many of us would have no problem rescuing our friends or loved ones from a physical threat. Like if one of them slipped on the side of a cliff and was barely hanging on, you wouldn't just look at them and hope that they would make it back up to safety. No, you would rush to their aid and give them a hand up. While it is important to save someone's physical life, it is far more important to save someone spiritually. Yet, we have a tendency to stand by and watch and hope 
and think that maybe, well, maybe they'll just uh, finally turn into the everlasting arms of God on their own. I hope that each of us can learn to be ready when it comes to preaching the Word of God and to show people the truth because if we're not doing this, again, we're doing a great disservice to them and to ourselves and we're letting God down. So again, I ask you, are you ready to preach the gospel? I hope this lesson has caused you to think about your life and for you to consider whether or not you are ready to follow Jesus all the way by denying yourself and putting Him first in your life. Of course, if you're not a Christian, I can tell you right now that you're not ready for the judgment day. If you want to know how to become a Christian, well, that's pretty easy. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for you and was raised up on the third day, as we learn in John 3 and verse 16. You must also repent, as Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, and you must confess Jesus as your Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and you must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, according to Acts 2 and verse 38. When you are baptized, your sins are forgiven, and you become a child of God. You are added to the church by God, according to Acts 2 and verse 47. You know, that's the easy part. The hard part is remaining faithful until you die, as Jesus said we must do in Revelation 2 and verse number 10. Well, this brings us to the end of part one. I hope that you will watch part two of our lesson as I continue to ask you the question, are you ready for the judgment day? When sorrows like sea.